welcome to a Rice University podcast. For more information about us, please visit our website at www.rice.edu. <laughs> I think we're ready to begin. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all here to our opening lecture in this year's Ciencia series. I hope you all stayed dry today. It was a challenge. My name is Susan McIntosh, and I'm the director of Ciencia. Uh, continuing our tradition of identifying large themes that permit us to a assemble a diverse set of lectures from across the university, CNCU this year addresses the topic of networks. Our speakers are drawn from engineering, social sciences, the natural sciences, and the humanities. Our aim is not in any of our lecture series to achieve comprehensive coverage or even uniformly cutting edge coverage, but basically to uh, attract a set of interesting and diverse lecturers that are accessible to a cross-section of the university, giving us um, a forum to come together and ask questions. Here, uh, our colleagues, in many cases, uh, give updates on their recent research, get to know each other a little bit better, meet afterwards for a wine and cheese reception, and build community here at the university. So networks. Today, we are so used to thinking uh, of network imagery with reference to all sorts of phenomena, social, biological, electrical, that it's odd to think that 100 years ago, the term was a primarily applied to transportation and communication grids. With the publication earlier this decade on scale-free networks, in which a small number of nodes have very large numbers of connections and vice versa, the application of network models has exploded. And our Bachner lecture this year is Albert Laszlo Barabasi. He was one of the co-authors on that seminal work. He was the senior author on it. And he will be talking in November on all the ways this insight can be applied to understand the architecture of complexity. Today, we are very fortunate to have a lecturer who works on social networks and their connection to the way power flows among elites. Michael Lindsay is Assistant Professor of Sociology and Associate Director of the Center on Race, Religion, and Urban Life here at Rice. He earned his PhD in Sociology at Princeton University, where he was a National Science Foundation Graduate Fellow. He also has a Master of Divinity from Princeton Theological Seminary and a postgraduate diploma from Oxford. In 2007, Oxford University Press published his book, Faith in the Halls of Power, How Evangelicals Joined the American Elite, which was named the best book of 2007 by Publishers Weekly. Many of you will have read reviews of this book in print media, including the New York Times, Time Magazine, USA Today, the Wall Street Journal, the Houston Chronicle, and others too numerous to mention. Or perhaps you caught Dr. Lindsay talking about his book on CNN, PBS, Fox News Channel, Al Jazeera, or CBS Radio. He's a popular and dynamic speaker, as evidenced by a long list of presentations at colleges and universities throughout the United States in 2008, leading me to feel quite fortunate that I run into him as often as I do on the fifth floor of Sewell, where we both have offices. He has published a number of articles in major journals, including the Sociological Review, the Journal for Scientific Study of Religion, the Journal of the American Academy of Religion, and Sociology of Religion. He also served for several years as a consultant for religion and culture to the George H. Gallup International Institute, where he directed several national surveys on a range of topics. Dr. Lindsay and George Gallup Jr. co-authored a book and appeared frequently in the national media on the lecture circuit discussing matters surrounding faith and society. Dr. Lindsay is a regular columnist for Rev, period, a widely read magazine for religious leaders. To top off all his accomplishments, he is a proud associate of Will Rice College. We are exceptionally fortunate to have him with us today to speak on his recently completed research for the White House Fellows Project, funded by the Carnegie Corporation, Coral, the Center on Race, Religion, and Urban Life, and the Baker Institute. So please help me welcome Michael Lindsay to the podium to speak on Networks as Channels of Power. Thank you, sir. Well, it's great fun to uh, be here uh, with you this afternoon. Thanks so much for the friendly faces that are out there. 
and uh, I'm so grateful for this opportunity. Susan McIntosh is a wonderful colleague, and uh, it is fun how we bump into each other, usually on Saturdays on the fifth floor of Sewell Hall, uh, trying to get extra hours in of uh, some work. I'm interested in how power works. How is it that a few thousand people in this country control so many resources? How is it that our lives are oriented around the decisions of a select group of people? Who are they and what are they like? That's what I'm interested in. Sociologists have been thinking about power for a long time. It goes back to George Zimmel and Max Weber. But you can also see notions of power more recently in studies that look at the ways that social epidemics give rise. Malcolm Gladwell popularized this notion with his book, The Tipping Point. But there's been a whole range of other interesting studies that have come out as a result looking at how social epidemiology is at work. Recently, uh, there was an article in the New York Times Sunday Magazine profiling the work of uh, two sociologists, one who's at uh, Harvard, one who's at University of California at San Diego, who've made some very interesting findings. They took an amazing set of data that's existed for about 50 years. It's known as the uh, Framingham Heart Study based on people who live in Framingham, Massachusetts, west of Boston. This particular study has been around for five decades, and it has interesting data that not only tracks health behaviors, but also social contacts, family members, and friends. And as a part of this research, these scholars, Nicholas Christakis and James Fowler, have been able to show how network connections, how friendship connections in this particular town can be conduits through which health behavior gets passed from one person to another. So, if your friends tend to be folks who watch their weight, then you too will be someone who watches their weight. If you tend to be somebody who smokes, you're likely to be around other folks who tend to smoke. And they are able to show some uh, amazing findings about how health behaviors can change. So if one of your friends quits smoking, and you're in that same network, then it increases your odds that you too will eventually quit. We also know that there's some interesting research about what's known as homophily. This is the notion that birds of a feather flock together. We tend to hang out with people who are like ourselves. Uh, Noah Mark is a sociologist at the University of North Carolina, and he's shown how we choose our musical tastes by the people we hang out with. If you're somebody who likes country music, you're likely to find other folks who like country music. And if you're going to take on a new musical genre as your favorite type of music, it's likely to occur because you meet other people who also like that music. So we're shaped in very powerful ways by the people we hang out with. This is fundamentally what we do in sociology, trying to understand how social dynamics influence individual behavior. And then more recently, there's been the whole introduction of formal network analysis, looking at how individuals or organizations constitute nodes within a network map and how we can see connection points between those, what we know as network ties. And that we try to look to see uh, how connected people are, and we refer to these as degrees of separation. We also know that there are people who are in the core of a particular network and those who are more peripheral. And so looking at how those core periphery dynamics are at work is one of the big questions that sociologists are interested in. And we also pay attention to holes that exist in networks. This is what entrepreneurs do. They look for holes in the marketplace where they might be able to fill in a new product or a new idea. It works the same way in social relations. We look for opportunities to build connections with folks where they didn't previously exist. Well, how does this relate to studying power? <coughs> Mark Granovetter wrote a, a piece uh, back in 1973 entitled The Strength of Weak Ties. He made the argument and then followed it up with a book called Getting a Job that we tend to rely on loose ties, not the kind of relationships you have with your family members or your college roommate, but instead with folks who you knew in college but weren't intimately associated with that you rely upon these weak connections when you want to do important things, like find employment. You see, before this, most people who studied it, we assumed that you really want to have strong, dense ties. These are the people who you call on when you need to borrow money or when you need to get out of jail. But when you need to do other kinds of things, weak ties can be incredibly important. We also know that 
innovation and influence work in different directions. Randall Collins is a sociologist at the University of Pennsylvania. And he's made an interesting observation. Most of the time when a new idea comes onto the scene, it does not start in the core center of a network. Usually it occurs on the outside and has a way of percolating in. By contrast, power and influence starts at the center and flows out. So, if you have a new idea for healthcare, you're likely not to be on the staff of the White House because most of those folks are considered to be core in setting healthcare policy. But a new idea might occur uh, from someone who's a professor at an institution who knows somebody who's working in the White House, or you might find that uh, innovation will come from surprising people. There's interesting research that shows that graduate students sometimes have the most creative papers in scholarly journals. Why is that? Because graduate students are reading lots of different subjects at the same time. And so they're able to put things together in ways that those of us who get more regimented into the field, we forget how to do that creative bridging of different gaps. So when you're looking at power and networks, it's important to keep in mind, innovation flows inward from the outside, whereas influence spreads outward from the core to the periphery. When you're studying elites, one of the things that is oftentimes studied is how network ties constitute power relationships. This is a diagram that came from the board analyst tool available through the corporate library, which is an online resource that my students and I use when we're conducting research on people. It's looking at how individual board members who are all a part of one particular organization, here Citigroup, how do they have other board relationships? And you can see that there are a couple of uh, institutions where we have multiple Citigroup board members who sit on other boards together. This is what we refer to as interlocking directorates. This is where the real power of corporate America exists. This is how you're able to get things done across industries, across sectors. This is how executives in Silicon Valley can oftentimes work with bankers on Wall Street. They use these network ties to build relationships. So I'm interested in studying powerful networks. Two years ago, I had the chance to serve on the Regional Selection Committee for a group that I didn't know a whole lot about known as the White House Fellowship. The White House Fellows have been around since 1964. This is their 45th year. President Johnson established the program really with a vision to try and recruit more young people into positions of civic leadership. The idea wasn't necessarily that they would come and work for the government for the rest of their life, but he wanted to take the cream of the crop in different fields, academia, science, medicine, law, the military. Give them a chance to work with a cabinet secretary or a senior White House official for one year, doing some important work, and then take that experience back with them to wherever they came from. It's an interesting idea because in the process, some very distinguished alumni have grown out of this particular elite network. So I was interested in trying to figure out how that particular group works. Now it's interesting, while I was working on this very talk, I realized the importance of elite network ties. I'm not part of them, but I try and ride the coattails as much as possible. This particular picture is an interesting story because it's a picture of President George W. Bush with the class of 2008-2009 fellows. Because of the Presidential Records Act, photographs from the George W. Bush administration do not have to officially be released until five years after he left office. All the other presidents, they store their archival materials at the presidential libraries, but his is not yet set up. But I really wanted to have a picture from each of the administrations. So I was thinking, well, how am I going to actually do that? Because I don't necessarily know who I call. And then I got to thinking, who do I know that might have some kind of connections that I could draw on? So you take the administration of uh, George W. Bush. There's an individual named Brian Kossaboom who, served as the, who currently serves as director of operations in the president's office in Dallas. Then there's a guy named David Scherzer who serves as a personal aide to the president. He's the, the young guy who is with the president at all times. Don Willett currently sits on the Supreme Court of Texas. He's an associate justice, and he had served in the George W. Bush administration in the first term. And Janet Eisenstadt was the director of the President's Commission on White House Fellows from 2005 to 2009. 
Now, I happen to serve on an advisory board at my alma mater, Baylor University, at the Honors College. And, as luck would have it, so does Don Willett. So while I was trying to uh, figure out how I could build some uh, relationships and some connections to see if there was a way in which I could uh, develop a tie, I began to think, who is it that I could try and connect with? I needed to get some way to contact Brian Kossaboom, but I didn't know him. So in the process, I began looking at uh, the ties that I had through every imaginal affiliation. And then I remembered Don Willett. Now, I knew Janet Eisenstadt because I had done this research on the White House Fellows. So we had that particular connection. So then I write uh, to Don an email and said, Don, can you help me out? I'm trying to get the release of a couple of pictures from the administration to be able to use for this report I've got coming out. And he said, well, let me see what I can do. And then he, in turn, contacts David Scherzer, who's the personal aide to the president, who was traveling with the president at the time. They were out of the country. David then forwards the email on to Brian Kossaboom, who's the director of operations in the president's office in Dallas. And Brian then, after a couple of days, sends me an email and says, sure, you can use the picture. <laughs> That's how elite networks work. Now you think, we all do that all the time. It's how you get a babysitter. It's how you find a new doctor. The difference is that when you're in elite positions, you have a whole entourage of gatekeepers to keep people like me from bothering your life. So you have to figure out a way to build relational ties to be able to get that kind of access. That's what I'm interested in doing. This is a picture of Jack McGinty. Jack, stand up if you would. Let's recognize. This is Rice's only alumnus who was a White House fellow. <laughs> this is a picture of Jack with uh, his wife Juanita shaking hands uh, with the Johnsons. Jack, you were in the class of 1967? Seven and eight, 1967 and 1968. So here they are uh, greeting the president after you've just found out that you were selected as a White House fellow. Pretty good Same moment. Day. Same day. It's a very good moment. One of the things that I'm interested in is how does this particular group, how does it actually work? And how does power flow through this one particular network? So I launched last year the White House Fellows Project, which involved a survey of uh, all the former fellows, we got a terrific response rate. There are about 625 uh, former fellows and current fellows who are alive today. 78% of them decided to participate in the survey, which was great. I'm in the midst of doing 125 interviews with former fellows, directors, individuals who've been associated with the program from its very beginning. I also uh, have begun doing archival research at the seven presidential libraries. A couple of weeks ago, went to the LBJ library and got a chance to see what did it look like in the very beginning. In essence, what I'm trying to figure out in this particular study is what role has this one network played in shaping the lives of people who go on to be in famous positions? I'm also, also interested in trying to get a sense of what distinguishes this particular group from all others. These are famous people who have lots of different ties. And then finally, what impact has this particular fellowship had not only on the individuals who are selected, but widely on American society? We do all kinds of ways to study uh, networks. In my work, I do a lot of interviews, large-scale interviews, uh, hundreds of interviews, as well as organizational analyses and quantitative analyses. So for all these White House fellows, my research team and I, we've been culling through as many online data sources as we can find and creating all kinds of interesting profiles, about 450 different variables we've mapped at this point, to get a sense of who are these people and what role has this particular network had in their life. Now, there are a lot of famous White House fellows. Colin Powell, Wesley Clark. Uh, in the upper left corner, that's Dennis Blair, Admiral Blair, who serves as the Director of National Intelligence currently in the administration. Henry Cisneros, Doris Meisner, and Elaine Chow. It also includes corporate CEOs at J.C. Penney, Travelocity, Tenneco, Levi Strauss, even Marsh Carter, the chairman of the New York Stock Exchange. It includes leaders in the nonprofit sector, such as Admiral Marty Evans, who has been the CEO of the American Red Cross, Girl Scouts of the USA, and is currently serving as the chair of the Ladies Professional Golf Association, as well as U.S. Senator Tim Wirth, who's now heading up the UN Foundation. It includes leaders in the media world, the CEO of CNN, the woman who was the first chair of NBC News, uh, Paul Jago in the bottom right-hand corner, who serves as the editorial page editor at the Wall Street Journal, 
Sanjay Gupta, who's on CNN. And it includes presidents of universities, the dean of Stanford Business School, the Georgetown School of Foreign Service, as well as the president of Colby College and Purdue University. It's a very elite network group of people. So what do we learn about them? If that's sort of a profile. Networks matter to powerful people for several different reasons. One is the norm of what I refer to as cosmopolitanism. We're unusual in the United States in that we expect of our top leaders for them to be able to build relationships with all kinds of people. If you're running to be US president, you have to be able to have a mid-morning briefing with nuclear physicists and to be able to have lunch with dock workers. And you have to be as comfortable in both settings. It's this expectation that you can be all things to all people. It requires a, a cosmopolitan sensibility where you can build bridges in lots of different ways. It's interesting because sports is actually one of the main ways people do this in the workplace. They use sports to talk with people who are at very different levels. But politics can accomplish it, popular culture, and the arts as well. Because cosmopolitan is an expectation, we expect of our leaders to have this cosmopolitan sensibility, networks matter a great deal. You've got to be connected with lots of different people in lots of different places. So how do you do that? You build up loose ties with different networks. We also have this uh, expectation that you'll use weak ties, the kind of ties that Mark Graniver says that help you get a job. Well, you also rely upon those to get elected to office. So the likelihood that you or I know who we voted for president personally is not really great. But we like to have the impression that we do. So we use six degrees of separation. We get excited when our mom's uncle, brother-in-law's girlfriend had a relationship that one time got Barack Obama elected to uh, state senate in Illinois. Figuring out ways in which we have some kind of personal connection. That's what we oftentimes do. And they matter to the way in which power flows. I became convinced when I wrote uh, my last book, uh, Faith in the Halls of Power. Most people who are in leadership positions today do not really exercise classic decision-making power. Maybe it happened that way 100 years ago, but it just doesn't work that way today. Now there's a notion that everybody ought to have a role in making decisions, this notion of participative decision-making. And so because there's this expectation that you can participate in decision-making, most leaders are reticent to make a decision and impose it down on their people. You don't see it in higher education, you certainly don't see it in politics, and you don't even see it in corporate America or even the military. There's a notion that we want to bring people along, that we want to persuade them. So what's the real form of power that people exercise when they're in leadership positions? I propose it's convening power. The ability to bring together different groups of people to get things done. If you want to pass a piece of legislation, you convene a group of people who come from lots of different walks of life. Same way if you want to make a new decision in your corporation. You convene different work groups, different sectors of the, of the company to bring them together. Convening power is really how things get done. And guess what? Convening power flows through networks. And then finally, trying to understand why is it that networks are so important to powerful people? In the interviews that I've done, I've learned that they're just like the rest of us. They long for a sense of community. They want to have connections. And yet, it's a very isolating experience to be in a top leadership position. So how do you get that? Well, you build relationships with people who have similar experiences, who are in similar walks of life. And that's why so many of these kind of forms of community are important. So in my last book, I looked at the role of religion among powerful people. Religion is a tremendous resource for building community. Shared beliefs, shared experiences become really powerful moments where people can share their lives. And that's why you, know, you find a lot of groups in Washington that are these Bible studies and prayer groups that exist. And uh, there's lots that can be said about them, and they're controversial in different ways. But fundamentally, I find them to be sort of support groups for powerful people, where they share parts of their lives. It's the quest for community. So if that's why networks are so important, how does this particular network work? A couple of weeks ago, I had the chance to interview General Colin Powell. It was an intimidating interview. He's a big guy, uh, 6'3 or 6'4, I guess, and stout. And he sits right across from me at this small conference table. And uh, I've told my colleagues, 
he must have learned this in his military training or diplomatic training, but most of the time when you're having a conversation with somebody, you ask them a question and they sort of look away to think about something. Not General Powell. You ask him a question, he looks straight at you. It's like he's looking for the answer to come out of you. There are moments when I'm thinking, am I supposed to look away? <laughs> Anyway, as we were talking, I mean, he's been involved in lots of different groups. Lots of different parts of his life have influenced his career trajectory. But he has referred to this particular experience as a turning point because many of the people that he met as a White House fellow ended up engaging him later on in life. Frank Carlucci is probably the best example. General Powell succeeded Frank Carlucci as uh, National Security Advisor. But he first worked with Frank Carlucci back when Carlucci was the head of the Office of Management and Budget. And Colin Powell was a White House fellow assigned to the director of OMB. Others have referred to this particular group as a game changer or as something that was revolutionary in their professional tra trajectory. Indeed, 96% of the people that I interviewed said that this particular fellowship was important in their own development. 69% of them said it's very important in their development. So if it's that significant, what should we make of it, and how do we actually study it? Well, there are a couple of things that make this particular group interesting. One is that it's a cohort model of bringing different accomplished people together. They take the top scientists that they can find, the top um, lawyers that they can find, and they give them a chance to work together, groups of 12 to 15 or so. Thousands of people will apply each year. Fewer than 20 are chosen. It's the most selective fellowship in the country, and has been, for 45 years. Because you have this diversity of uh, professions that are represented, people who later on go to really prominent positions, they build relationships with others in different sectors of society early on. Most fellows are serving in their late 20s or their early 30s, but they build relationships that last with them for a long time. One of the things that I was interested in was trying to get a sense of how this particular elite network influenced Behaviors. The best way to understand behaviors is by looking also at attitudes. Gordon Alport, about 50 years ago, made the argument that contact between peers can in many ways influence people's attitudes. Contact theory has most helpfully been applied to race relations. So if you're a, a young white man who's never been around uh, African Americans, and suddenly you find somebody at school who's about your same socioeconomic level, in many ways you're equals, but you're of different races. Young black man, young white man. And you get to know each other. That contact is very important in shaping both of your attitudes about entire races. Contact theory has been applied to lots of different things, but to the best of my knowledge, it has not been applied to understanding elite behavior. I thought the White House Fellowship gave a great moment where we could sort of take this theoretical idea and see does it make any kind of difference. And that's important because in today's workplace world, we're very specialized. We tend to know one particular domain. President Clinton, when he was elected, he was an expert politician, had spent his entire professional life in government. And that's true for most of us. If you're a world-class mathematician, you've been in mathematics all your life. If you're a doctor, you've been in medicine all your life. The 20th century has been devoted to becoming more and more expert uh, through specialization. The challenge is that when you really rise up into top leadership positions, whether you're a college president or the CEO of a company, you have to have a generalist orientation. You've got to be able to work with lots of different kinds of people. If you're a college president and you're a mathematician, suddenly you've got to deal with those Folks in the humanities. You've got to be able to interact with social scientists and with engineers. You have to have a generalist orientation. So this particular group is important because it's one of the first opportunities where many of these fellows who are accomplished in their respective areas have regular interaction with somebody who they consider to be a peer who's in a different area. General Powell, for example, said the White House Fellows Program meant instant entree to, pe uh, to people a military man like me did not ordinarily encounter at places like Fort Devens. The people I met during that year shaped my future in ways unimaginable to me at the time. One of the interesting things about this particular group is that it, it oftentimes recruits 
about a third of the class come from the US military. You cannot be um, a federal employee unless you're in the military and apply for the fellowship. So if you're working in Washington, if you're employed by the federal government, by and large, you're not allowed to apply, except for the military are allowed to apply. There was a time when they, uh, that was debated, and one year they were not allowed to, but, but um, ever since then they've done it. And there's a, a larger group of people who have a military background who may not be active duty, but at one time served in the military. And I became interested in that. There's actually a, a wide range of involvement. On the low end, we've seen, for example, that there's been uh, as little as 6% of a particular class of fellows came from a military background. But on the other end, there's been as many as 69% of a particular class. Now, here we're talking about a class of 10 or 12, maybe 15 people. So I was interested to see what difference does it make if you have more military people in a particular class, does that influence other people's attitudes? Does it influence their behavior about, say, the U.S. military? It's hard uh, to be able to figure out what this effect means if you're talking about individual percentage points because um, you wouldn't add a percentage point of a person, you would add a whole person. So what I did is, I, in from my analysis, I broke these into deciles. So if, um, if there was 1% or 10% of your class, you were in that 10% bracket. Likewise, if there was 60% or if there was 69%, you're in that one same bracket. So I've broken it down into deciles to see the effect of what percentage of folks who are in your class and how does that influence your individual behaviors or attitudes toward the military. And it's important because we know that through the fellowship, people have important contacts. So you have these professional ties which have lots of friendship connections. Um, Jack can tell stories about how these become really good friends, not just people that you work with for 12 months, but you build a, a lifelong uh, relationship. I had the chance to interview uh, Dean Peter Crow, sir, was in uh, Jack's class of fellows, who later on was selected as the dean of the Georgetown School of Foreign Service. And he, as we're talking, I'm doing the interview, and he's talking about Jack as a, a long lost friend that he built this connection with 40 years ago and uh, still has this deep tie. So these friendship ties make a difference. And also, there's this interesting education program. So twice a week, the fellows meet together, usually over lunch, to interact with somebody who's in a really powerful position. And guess what? A lot of those people are from the military. Generals, commanders, Secretary of Defense. They've got that kind of background, and they're part of the educational program. So I want to see what difference does it make in it predicting how people relate to attitudes about the military. So we did some statistical analyses. Now you don't have to pay attention to all the numbers here. Just look at that last column, Model 4. Model 4 is trying to predict how positive an attitude does an individual White House fellow have about the military. So we're asking them to rate their level of confidence in the U.S. military. Would you say that you have a great deal of confidence or somewhat, are you somewhat confident or not very much confidence? We want to see what are those variables that most likely predict it. There's a couple of demographic factors that we know always make a difference. Gender makes a difference. Men tend to be uh, more positive toward the military than women. We also know that um, on the whole, being white makes someone more positive toward the military than non-white. And there's also some other characteristics. For example, if you express a generalized sense of distrust toward other people, that you, uh, in the process, you tend to be more in favor of military action because you have a little bit more of a uh, position of fear. So if you throw those things into the model, we want to see what effect does it have if you happen to come from a military background yourself or have a family member who came from the military. And then, perhaps more important, is we wanted to see is there a significant relationship between the, the way in which your particular class was put together and your attitudes toward the military? And guess what we found? It makes a huge difference. Huge difference. For every one more person who's in your class who was uh, from a military background, your overall level of confidence jumps by 27 points, percentage points. So if you've got something where you've got a relationship uh, where you have, let's say, um, five people in your class from a military background, if just one more person is added to that class that comes from a military, your 
odds of you saying you have a great deal of confidence is much, much higher. 27 percentage points difference. That's when you map out those particular variables. And here's the most amazing thing. Those differences remain whether you were a White House fellow last year or 40 years ago. You've got a, a significant degree of influence just by this one particular experience. One of the persons who I interviewed uh, this past year is Dan Fletcher. Dan is a professor at Berkeley, University of California at Berkeley, and he was a Rhodes Scholar, incredibly bright guy, a bioengineer. And while we were talking, I said, you know, what's it been like to be a White House fellow in this experience? And he said, well, it's interesting because I really love the diversity of opinions that are represented in our class. At Berkeley, we might like to think it's a very progressive and liberal and free-thinking location, but in some ways it suffers from what any group of people that think very similarly suffer from, which is the lack of analysis, a lack of being challenged, and that's what I find most intellectually satisfying about being here. So Dan Fletcher sort of got me thinking of how this might actually play out. This matters a great deal because there's a huge body of literature that says that attitudes predict people's behaviors. But if you look just at the military, it's very interesting because our government set it up from the very founders to when the Pentagon was established in the middle of the 20th century so that our military is not finally led by military officers, but instead it's by a civilian elite. The Secretary of State is not someone who is current active duty military, nor is the Deputy Secretary of Defense or the Assistant Secretary of Defense. Now, they oftentimes work together. Obviously, you don't want the, De the Secretary of Defense doesn't want to do something the Joint Chiefs don't like. But there do come times when there are conflicts. And constitutionally and by law, the final say is in the hand of civilians. So civilian attitudes, people who are in elite positions who don't come from a military background, it really matters how they feel about the military. And if you know anything about elite university life, you know that over the last 30 years, the military, which was once very much at home in elite higher education, has become more and more distant. Uh, places like Harvard, for example, don't allow ROTC chapters to exist officially on campus. And indeed, uh, military recruiters are not welcomed as official representatives on recruiting weekends, for example, at Harvard Law School. It relates to uh, public policy issues and different opinions that the institution has. But this is an institution that once was very much at home in elite life, and over the last 34 years has in some ways become more distant. The White House Fellowship represents just one case, I'd say it's a pretty important case, of where we can see that contact between military and non-military people occurs on a regular basis, and it can actually shape elite attitudes. <coughs> And that contact persists over a long period of time. 40% of the White House fellows changed career directions after they were a fellow. That means that a lot of folks who were not serving in government suddenly become interested in public service. Folks who were once in law decide that they want to go into business or into finance. 61% of the fellows say that the fellowship has given them contacts that helped advance their career. It's a powerful group of people who do some very interesting things. I was interested in understanding more broadly how this particular bit of data that I collected relates to wider cultural change. When I was doing my research uh, for Faith in the Halls of Power, I became interested in seeing how is it that an individual leader can bring about wider cultural change. In the end, I decided that there are five key components that I think make a real difference of how cultural change occurs from the bottom up. At base, you have to have an articulate, articulated sense of vision a meaning system, something that helps ground a sense that we want to change things. The civil rights movement oftentimes used the language of the black church to frame a desire for a changed society. So you have a basic set of principles, you articulate that in trying to bring about a desire for cultural change. That in turn takes individuals who say, you know, I've got some agency, I've got some resources that I can devote, and they start to try and figure out how can they pour those resources into whatever they're trying to bring about the change to, to be. That in turn leads folks to start to try and collaborate, build some connections across various points of networks. This is where convening power begins to get exercised. In the process of that, you have the establishment of a sense of community, 
where people begin to confirm what they originally wanted to bring about the change. And then finally, they start to implement. They produce a piece of legislation, they make a film, they write a book. Some form of culture is made, and in the process, cultural change begins to take shape. You take the meaning system, draw upon that to bring about a sense of uh, resources, money, political influence, social connections. That in turn engages the networks, and it's through the networks that people begin to convene different groups of people. In those networks, you begin to not only build ties, but actually a sense of community, and that in turn gets folks to try and make something to change the world. That's how we make a change from an individual to wider cultural change. It works when you're trying to understand how is it that evangelicals have become more influential in American politics over the last 30 years, and it works the same way when you're trying to understand how is it that uh, in elite life, military opinions have been dramatically shaped by contact through networks like the White House Fellowship. So that at least gives you a snapshot uh, view of some of the interesting things that we learned. White House Fellowship project is um, its actually really hot off the press. It's not officially released until next Friday. Um, we'll be releasing some of the results from the survey that we did to the national media. But there's a website we'd love for you to visit, whitehousefellowsproject.org, where you can get more information. Not yet, but next Friday you'll get some more information. So that at least gives you a sense of some of the things that we learned. What questions can I answer? Things that you're curious about. We want to make sure that uh, we can hear you if you have a question. So we've got some microphones we'd like to pass around. I wanted to make sure to save some time for us to ask some questions. I interviewed some amazing people. So if you want to know the deepest, darkest secrets, now's your moment to ask. <laughs> or other things that you're curious about. Who's got the first question? Oh, thank you. <laughs> so who's got the first question? Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned a lot about the connections, the military, uh, the way the, the way military background and a lot of the people sort of creates a more positive role uh, or idea of the military in people's minds. Is there any? Did you notice any role between like similar with religion? Were more evangelicals who were fellows create a, an environment more positive towards evangelical ideas in the fellows? So we did measure, um, in the survey and in the interviews, we did measure uh, religious tradition and importance of religion. Um, there aren't a lot of evangelicals, uh, at least folks who are uh, outspoken as evangelical Christians, who have served as White House fellows. So it's a pretty small population we're dealing with. Um, I think that probably a, a, a more helpful way would be to look maybe, let's say, at uh, administrations, because that's where you have a larger uh, group that you can draw on. And you can clearly see that contact theory does indeed, it, it's much harder for you to um, use, to rely on stereotypes about a particular group once you know individuals who represent that group. It, contact does make a difference. So my hunch is that it, it wasn't rocket science to figure out that if you had contact between professions that people's opinions about those professions might change. But what's interesting about it is to see that the power of these effects that last for a long period of time. And that's significant because most of professional life exists in individual silos. Uh, Steve, you've got the microphone, so. <laughs> uh, w thank you, Michael. Wonderfully interesting. And what struck me is that this seems that these networks operate for all of us, even if we're not in the elite, right? And that, and that social capital is a centrally important part of all of our lives and our abilities to get anything done. And I was wondering, what is unique, do you think, about the networks that you've studied that is really different from, or does it illuminate instead, the broader networks that, that us non-elites are, are very much a part of? Yeah, that's a great question. So we do indeed have points of similarity. So the kinds of networks that we're involved in, we rely on them in much the same way that we need to, that, that elites do. The difference is that our networks don't have the barriers around them. So we don't have the secretarial gatekeepers. We don't have the high walls. Uh, typically, it's easier to become part of my network than it would be to become part of the network of uh, the president of the United States, right? And uh, I would say that elites as a whole have many more network ties. Uh, I was looking back over some research, for example, um, and I saw Ambassador Untermeyer slip, slip in. It's good to see you, Chase. Um, he served as Director of President, Presidential Personnel for President George Herbert Walker Bush, this administration. It's interesting because I was looking back over the data 
And uh, the very first uh, political race that George Bush entered into grew out of the Christmas card list of the Bushes. That when they were trying to figure out who could be early supporters, they, they drew on these boxes of Christmas cards that Barbara Bush would keep from year to year and see who could be some folks who could be early supporters. And uh, that's, that's what we find is that uh, I might send out 100 Christmas cards, but when you're in elite positions, you send out 1,000 Christmas cards. It's, the, it's the, the span and the breadth of your ties that I would say those networks become really important, which is why this particular group, the White House Fellowship, is so interesting because these are folks who have lots of possible network ties, and yet for many of them, it's one of the most salient and trying to understand why is it that it's so important to them. I think it's because it played a formative role in their development and came at just the right moment in their lives. Yes, sir. Uh, Michael, let's take the flip side. Um, you've been talking about weak ties, and what about dense ties? And I think thinking hard about race and, and poverty, you might want to speak a little bit about why, why dense ties might um, hold people back. Absolutely. Yeah, because uh, the, the, the fewer number of weak ties that you have, the fewer opportunities you have to break out of whatever particular cycle you might be in. And uh, that's probably one of the interesting things. That's that cosmopolitanism that I was talking about that distinguishes those who are, let's say, upper middle class and upper class from those who are lower and working classes, is that they just have uh, fewer opportunities. It sort of relates to interesting research that Basil Bernstein, the sociolinguist, uh, showed about the ways in which young people talk. He looked at four-year-olds, for example, and tried to analyze how they would describe stories. And those children who came from lower classes and working classes tended to tell stories that assumed that the other person knew everyone that was in their network because they could not conceive that there was something beyond their particular world. Whereas those kids who came from middle and upper middle classes and upper classes, they tended to recognize that their world was just one of many possible worlds that existed. And so he said that the lower and working class kids tend to speak in what he referred to as restricted codes. So they would just assume that when they mention Bobby, you know who Bobby is. Whereas an upper middle class kid might say, Bobby, he's my friend from school to explain who it is that's part of the story. And I think that that's the, the same notion of the density of those ties. Particularly those folks who are um, caught in the web of poverty uh, rely a great deal upon those, those dense ties because they help them uh, survive, they help them uh, make ends meet. They rely upon them, but they also become ensnared by them and they don't have a chance to break out. Great question. Hey, Dr. Lindsay. Hey, yeah. um, so I understand the importance of having like all of our elites in a tight network to get a lot of things accomplished, but do, do, you, believe, do you believe that there are like some major risks in having, I guess, like a sort of an oligarchy set kind of like the best of the best together in terms of like rejection in popular culture and, and like, a, I don't know, disillusionment from the, co like the common man? Yeah. Well, I'm certainly not calling for sort of a return to Plato's vision of the guardians with the small uh, political elites who who rule and we don't know who they are and they're not in touch with everyday reality. I'm not in support of that. And I don't think that the White House Fellowship uh, runs the risk of that. I think, frankly, the diversity of the professional backgrounds of the people who are there, the intentional you know, desire to recruit broadly across the country, different walks of life, that, that helps mitigate against that. But in all honesty, those 6,000 people who end up ruling the world, they look more alike than different. They come from the same kind of schools. They have similar kind of backgrounds. There's a lot of social cohesion that exists. That's not necessarily a good thing, but it is a social reality. That is how uh, empirically it works out. What I think is that it's important for there to be other ways in which those folks can have build ties. So in my research on religion, for example, I mentioned about a, an alarming trend that I found that so many of these folks who are in elite positions tend to not have a lot of relationships with people who are at different walks of life. And I wrote a piece that referred to this as the creation of the gated community of the soul. It used to be that congregations were one of the few places where bank presidents and bank tellers not only knew each other, but they interacted on a regular basis as, in some ways, peers. They, you know, worked the nursery together. Today, what we see is that because of the ways that our neighborhoods have developed and the ways in which those social connections are formed along socioeconomic ties, Churches are becoming as socially divided on economic terms as we see it divided, for example, on racial terms. 
And I think that that's, that's really problematic. So one of my words of encouragement to smart students like Alex is to make sure to figure out ways to build connections with folks in lots of different walks in life because that's what, that's what will help you to actually, in the end, retain that sort of cosmopolitan sensibility, which I think is so critical for good public civic leadership for the common good. Michael, one thing you just mentioned was that the uh, fellows were more like each other than they were different. Did you find differences in the fellows across different administrations, which I, I think your study probably spanned, what, nine different administrations? Right. Oh, yeah, it's an interesting question. One of the things that I was particularly interested in was to see if a Democrat is in office, are there a lot more Democrats who are White House fellows or vice versa? Because you're finally selected at the, um, at the level where I was a selection panelist, you're not a political appointee. I was just a, you know, a ringer they pull off the street. But they, uh, when you get to the national finals, you're actually selected by a commission that is appointed by the president. So it's a political appointment. It's a bipartisan group but it tends to lean in one direction or another based on who's in the White House. So I was interested to see, you know, are there partisan affiliations? And, and frankly, walking into this study, based upon sort of general impressions of administrations, I assumed that the most recent administration, that of George W. Bush, might be the most partisan, where there are a lot more Republicans than there have been in other administrations. In fact, that's not the case. It was one of the most evenly split between Democrats, Republicans, and independents. The more, most partisan administrations were uh, Reagan and Clinton. More Republicans were in the Reagan administration and more Democrats were in the Clinton administration. But here's the thing. I don't think it's coming as a result because there's political cronyism. In fact, if anything, there's sort of a push not to ask those kind of questions. They don't ask it in the selection process. And they, they really work to try and not disclose it when you're applying because they don't want to in any way jinx themselves. But people tend to be drawn to administrations, especially early on. So this year, there will be a record number of Democrats who apply for the White House Fellowship because they see it as a chance to actually join an administration that they believe in and they support. And that's where you see some of those kind of partisan differences. In terms of men and women, uh, races, uh, underrepresented groups, you do find that Democratic administrations tend to have more of that representation, more folks who are non-white or women than in Republican administrations. But um, it, it has evened out more recently, most, uh, since the last 10 years or so, I'd say that we really haven't seen that difference. It was more the case early on in administrations. Geographically, we find that there's not uh, you know, a significant relationship between who's in power and who actually gets selected. Yes, sir. You uh, briefly mentioned this, but I was just wondering if there were any other surprising uh, characteristics or predictors of people who are very well connected in, in those elite levels? Um, they tend to have uh, that cosmopolitanism woven into their lives from a very early age. So they traveled abroad early. They speak a, a, a language other than English. They uh, have parents who were professionals and who regularly engaged in lots of different experiences. There's uh, Annette LaRoe, a wonderful uh, sociologist, who talks about the ways in which upper middle class parents try to cultivate a certain kind of sensibility. And you can see that um, that happens even among the White House fellows, that those, those fellows who came from families where there was a real desire for exposing their kids to lots of different experiences, they tend to be ones who have these broad, diverse network ties. And that helps them. Because like I mentioned, you, you achieve a lot by becoming a specialist, becoming an expert in your field. But when you rise to a senior position in leadership, whether it's a corporate leader or a college president or a politician, you have to have a generalist orientation. And that's when you really rely upon those diverse network ties across different sectors. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, we'll take one more question. Um, I don't have a background in sociological research, so I'm not sure um, how to think about this. But given that this is a very small group and you're, you're doing a lot of really in-depth research, did you look at all at people who made it really far in the selection process and weren't selected? It seems at some level that that choice is going to become somewhat arbitrary. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how you would develop a control group, but I guess that's the kind of question I'm asking. Man, I re thank you. I, it's, I really wanted to be able to compare those people who are, there's 30 national finalists, and about 15 will be chosen and 15 will not. These are referred to as the other 15. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was really interested in trying to study them. And so I began asking questions of the director who was serving and then asking of some commissioners because I wanted to figure out who are these people. I know, for example, that in the very first year of the fellowship, one person who was not selected was Elizabeth Hanford, who later on became Elizabeth Dole. And obviously, it didn't hold her back. She served in uh, two different cabinet positions and was a U.S. senator. But she was upset that she wasn't chosen a White House fellow, and she's gone on the record as saying that. <laughs> so I was interested to see who else is out there who was a finalist but who wasn't actually chosen. Here in Houston, Archie Dunham, uh, for example, CEO of ConocoPhillips, said that he, uh, has mentioned that he was uh, a finalist but ended up not getting selected. So there are some amazing people, and I'd love to be able to compare that. Here's the, here's the thing. When President Johnson established the program, though, he was concerned that this would become a political liability of who was selected and who was not selected. So the actual office of the White House Fellowship is not housed officially under the White House, but it's under the Office of Personnel Management. And as such, it is not subject to the same kind of um, legal requirements for uh, documentation in the Presidential Records Act. And so, starting in 1964, after they had chosen the first class of fellows, they destroyed the files of those people who were national finalists but not selective. And the tradition has continued to this very day. So, unfortunately, I wasn't able to get that kind of a control group, but that would have been amazing if I had. Thank you guys very much. Great to be with you. I want to thank Michael for an, an absolutely marvelous talk that has certainly managed to remind me how uh, the many things I have to be grateful for as a specialist in a cosmopolitan university where students, undergraduates and graduate students constantly keep me uh, aware of the importance of cosmopolitanism. And, uh, and uh, so now I want to thank you all for coming out on uh, what started out as a rather dreary day and joining us for this. And I hope you will avail yourself of the opportunity to network outside here at our wine and cheese reception and uh, talk further with Michael and carry on the conversation. And we'll hope to see you next month when Lauren Ansel Myers from uh, Integrative Biology at UT Austin will be speaking about network models for what else? The H1N1 swine flu virus. So <laughs> we'll see you then. Thank you very much. This program is protected by copyright and may not be redistributed in whole or in part without the express written consent of Rice University Digital Media Services.